And uh, although you all, sometimes I get so annoyed by the request to get my talk title and my blurb and my readings out early, I see why it's so important. All the music, the readings, everything supports the message. So I'm so grateful and thankful for that little urging and nudging frame. No names. <laughs> so why did I choose this topic? Utilizing our six <coughs> mental <coughs> faculties to create the life of our desires. You might be wondering. Well, according to some authorities, our mental faculties are, for the most part, dormant. Upon our entrance into the physical world, and unless they're discovered, trained, developed, and used, <laughs> unlikely, or more than likely, they will remain dormant. During our entire lifetime. But there is an alternative. Alternatively, if any or all of these faculties are developed and consciously applied, then we can create the life of our desires. So what are the six mental faculties? I'm going to start with imagination because in the ordering of the six powers, that one is the most important, and that one, as we become older, is the most utilized. In order to reignite that faculty, we have to act as children. You know, children imagine. When I was preparing this talk, I thought about growing up. And there were two other siblings, and I was the middle child, and so I suffered from middle child syndrome. What that meant is I spent a lot of time alone. The oldest was the oldest, and, the, and she was the first, and she was the favorite. And the youngest was the last, and she was the baby. And we got to, we've got to coddle her, Michelle, you just kind of came along. But what I did with that positioning is I used to just daydream, just imagine the life of my dreams. And the truth of the matter is, I experienced a different reality than those two siblings who didn't develop that faculty. So what is imagination? It's the ability of the mind to be creative. It's the faculty of action, of forming new ideas, images, or concepts. And everyone possesses some imagination ability. <clears throat> in some, it may be highly developed. And in others, it may manifest in a weaker form. It presents in various degrees in different people. But like other skills, it too can be developed. Imagination has a great role and value in each of our lives. It is much more than just daydreaming. We all use it whether consciously or unconsciously. In most of our daily affairs, we use our imagination whenever we plan an event. In our minds, we see exactly the result that we want to achieve. We want a certain outcome for that event. We see it before it actually happens. Imagination is not limited to only seeing pictures in our minds. It includes all of the five senses and the feelings once there is a mental image in the mind. One can imagine a sound. Can you think of a sound? I want you all to imagine the sound of a didgeridoo. You really have to stretch your imagination on that one. Imagine a taste. Your mother's favorite dish that she made for you. Can you conjure up that taste again in your imagination? Or a smell, mm, the aroma, Ooh, of certain dishes being prepared. And then also we have physical sensations. Everything and all experiences have their starting in imagination. Charles Fillmore of the Unity Movement said, out of the omnipresent substance, your mind forms whatever it wants by the power of imagination. 
You can picture your, in your mind the things that you desire and bring them into your manifest world. It is important to point out that although it sounds as though the imagination does the work of bringing forth a desired manifestation, this is not correct. The imagination does not cause manifestation. It only produces the mental image of that which is to be made manifest. The other mental powers play critical roles as well. The creative power of imagination has an important role in the achievement of personal success. So what I'd like to do is actually engage you all today. I want you to stand up, if you would, and you need to have your invisible bubble around you because you're going to need a little room for some movement. So what I'd like for you all to do is just comfortably reach around you as far as you can, look over your shoulder, and then make a mental note of what you see. And then come back to center. Now what I'd like you to do is to go within for just a moment. I want you to imagine if you can, 20 years ago, 1998 was the year. You may have just been an idea. <laughs> However, <laughs> if you have made your physical appearance in 1998, I want you to imagine you all the agility, the flexibility, the youth, that you had, the high-functioning ability of, of your every part of your body. Just imagine how you were able to move, how fast you could run, how high you could jump 20 years ago. Have a vivid idea of that in your mind. Lock it in. And now, if you would, open your eyes yet again. And we're going to engage in the same experiment we did before. However, it's 1998. So I want you to see how far you can go. Lock it in. Come back to center. You may be seated. geriatric individuals. Why did I do this? Because it was a psychological experiment that was performed by a Harvard psychologist by the name of Ellen Langer. And what she did is she took eight men who were 70 years and older to a monastery. It was a controlled experiment. She went backwards in time to 1979. And she had these men do the same thing I had you do. When I tested this experiment, I got, wow, whoa, because these geriatric individuals were able to go a little bit farther than they could the first time around. I trust that you did too. Why is that? Because they used the power of their imagination. They thought about and really embodied, because they engaged in this experiment for an entire week. Living, moving, being 20 years younger. What were the results? They felt younger and their cognitive abilities improved because they were tested before and they were tested after and they did little exercises like I had you do. Albert Einstein said that imagination is better than knowledge. 
Knowledge is limited. Imagination is limitless. And imagination po positively affects the quality of your lives. So talk to me. Did it, was anybody able to go a little bit farther? Yes. I know, I've, and I've done this before, and I know that I did. So what is the next faculty? It's that of will. So let me say a little bit about will. It's the ability to give ourselves a command and then follow it. It is our ability to determine what we intend to take place or happen in our lives. It is focused intention. Focus intention is a tremendous power and is critical for goal attainment. Our intellect and our emotions are subservient to our will. Ernest Holmes told us to turn away from conditions. It is the will faculty that facilitates our ability to move from condition-based thinking to possibility thinking. And then there's the intuition. And this is one of my favorite mental faculties because I'm really working to develop it. So I'm going to say a little bit more about that than I did will. It's our ability to know beyond knowing, to tap into infinite intelligence, so you all, I would like to introduce you to your intuition. As a tool, it's a tool that is entirely within your conscious control. You can establish an accurate and reliable system of access that works whenever and wherever you need it. Accessing your intuition accurately and reliably is a skill that does take some practice. <coughs> Your subconscious and your conscious minds need to be trained and conditioned to work together to receive information from your higher self. A little bit more about intuition. We're all born with it. It's resident within us. It's always there to guide, to protect, and to help us. And as we grow into adulthood, we may push this intuition to the side to conform to what society says we should do. The more we do this, the less we tend to listen to that still, small voice. And like anything else in life, when you stop using it, you what? You lose it. A muscle must move. And I must see. A brain must think. The same holds true for intuition. And in order to be able to use your intuition, you must be able to recognize it when it speaks to you. Intuition usually isn't loud or demanding. It's subtle and communicates in different ways for different people. For example, you may receive visual messages, such as images that appear in quick flashes, or visions that unfold slowly, like a movie. Your intuition might speak to you as a hunch, a thought, or in words. Or for me, it's an itch, itch in my left hand. <laughs> you may even be able to enter into a dialogue with your intuition to get more information and clarity. So how do we develop the intuition? I reference many, many books on this topic. And one practice that showed up in every one was meditation. Visioning is a form of meditation. Because what happens in visioning is you ask the universe a question. And then you go within, you're quiet, and you're still, and you wait for the way in which your intuition informs you. 
of the answer to that question. It doesn't always come automatically at the time that you're engaged in that meditative practice. But you've asked the question of, a uni of the universe, and the universe must respond. It's a law. So the question is, are you alert? Are you awake? Are you aware of all of the ways that spirit informs you of what is yours to do or the answer to your question? So that's why we meditate and that's why we vision. And then the fourth mental faculty is that of perception. It's the ability to align oneself with the meaning of things that we place upon the things or the conditions that we experience in our life. It's synonymous with belief. Perception is considered to be relative. The perception formed is a direct result of how individuals approach the subject or the object in question. Just a simple example is you have two persons look at a glass of water. And the glass is filled to the midpoint. One person's perception is the glass is what? Half full. While the other person's perception, and they're looking at the same glass, is that the glass is half empty. empty. Perception is a process by which people translate sensory impressions into a coherent and unified view of the world around them. Though necessarily based on incomplete and unverified information, perception is equated with reality for most practical purposes, and it guides our human behavior. So there is truth to that act that perception is reality. Viktor Frankl, Holocaust <clears throat> survivor, said this, perception is our most authentic human freedom. Because he said, you can incarcerate my body, but you cannot incarcerate my mind. Then there's memory. When trained, it gives us the ability to harness our memory in both directions. What does that mean? We can look back at past experiences. However, we can also use our memory for the way ahead. How do we do that? It's when we visualize. It's when we perceive that what it is that we want to make manifest can be made manifest. When we get in touch with that vibration of having the thing that we desire, for being the person that we want to be, when you get into that feeling nature, you lock it into your memory. You can always retrieve that information. The memory that is produced is affected not just by the direct prior experiences that we have, but also our perception of the future that we can have. Ernest Holmes asserted that memory of itself is an unconscious operation of what was once a conscious thought. By changing our thoughts, we can remold our affairs and by right thinking bring new conditions into our lives. Wayne Dyer is quoted as saying, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Then lock that into your memory. So information plus emotion equals long-term memory. The last one is reason. And I associate that with reasonable, the ability to reason. Most of the world looks to conditions to determine what is possible, what is reasonable, what we've already experienced heretofore. We may want to expand our ideas about what's reasonable. 
<coughs> uncommon success requires uncommon sense. Look at what is seeking to emerge through you right now. What is your life mission? What are your heart's desires? Pour life into them through your imagination. Use your memory futuristically to perceive events and search in situations and circumstances that you want extant in your lives. Train your perception to see the glass as being half full, regardless of what the conditions might be telling you. There is good in everything. Tap into your intuition. Listen to it for guidance. Life is like an egg. If broken from an outside force, life ends. If broken from an inside force, it begins. All great things begin first in our own minds. Everything begins within us. When you've been gifted with these six mental faculties and you recognize this, hone and develop these skills to create the lives that you desire. When we live our lives from the inside out, we get more of that which we want, which we choose. And in the words of Rumi, he said, paraphrasing, substitute enchantment for cleverness. Enchantment is just a word for imagination. Things magical, things that go beyond what currently exists. And he says, substitute that for cleverness. That means you're, that, that mind that is telling you it's not practical, don't do it. That's not your intuition speaking. That's your ego speaking. So listen to that still, small voice. God gifted us with six magical mental powers. Use them for good. And so it is. Amen. So it is.